Hi folks, this is uh, Jason. Hope you are okay today. Uh, we're having a live Google Hangout. And basically, um, in this Google Hangout, I'll be waiting around and giving uh, anybody an opportunity, whatever their belief is, to try and convince me out of my Christian faith to offer me uh, arguments or evidence that prove to me that my faith's not true and you have 15 minutes to in your argument present whatever you want to say to critique uh, Christianity then after your 15 minutes uh, you're not allowed to reply I will respond to what you have to say uh, and critique your 15 minutes so uh that's the opportunity there if people want to take it while we wait for people to come into the chat uh if if people uh, want to come in uh we'll be listening to the lectures of uh craig keener um on uh discipleship uh so so without further ado uh we're going to listen to uh craig keener uh, the disciple to the nations matthew's missiology at Beeson Divinity School, and Craig Keener was an atheist who scholar who uh, was an atheist who became uh, a Christian and is a very eminent Christian scholar. So we'll listen to Craig Keener uh, until someone comes into the room uh, to offer uh, to take up the challenge of the fifteen minutes. All right. Thank you for listening and take care. For sure. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter twenty-eight. Verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority is given, or all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The word of the Lord. Your majesty, thank you for your presence, for you said you would be with us to the end of the age in what you have called us to do. And Lord, you have called us to make disciples of the nations. All of us, each of us in our different ways, you've called us to make disciples of the nations. Lord, please touch our hearts now and speak to us your heart and your mind through your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It's a, it's a great privilege to be here. I have great respect for your, for your dean, Timothy George, and, have, um, and, and also for others whose works I've read, Gerald Bray and others, and uh, of course, uh, some of your New Testament professors who are in my discipline, I know personally, uh, Frank, Frank Thielman and Oswaldo Padilla. So it's, it's a privilege for me to, to be here. My object and my interest in cross-cultural settings is not, uh, it's not just because it's pervasive in the New Testament, although it is, but also when I was in seminary myself, I had a number of international friends who shared with me their passions for uh, what was going on in, in their own cultures. And later they persuaded me to uh, eventually visit some of their, their cultures. And I found that it was, it was never boring, not just because one of my first experiences in Latin America was um, nearly getting decapitated by accident, or that one of my uh, first experiences in Africa, just when I was getting over jet lag, I was awakened by the sound of assault rifles and tear gas canisters. I hate it when that happens. I have stories from the, from the US too. And of course, I now because I have teenagers, but, uh, but they're wonderful. But uh, the best excitement that I got was just the cross-cultural friendships that I developed. And one of them was with a friend named Medin. Um, we, we got to be really close friends through InterVarsity Christian Fellowship at Duke. And then she went, uh, 
she went back to her country and I was trying to urge her not to go because there was a civil war going on at the time that she went back. But she went back and things were all right for a while. And then one day after a few years, I got a letter from her saying, please pray for me. I don't know if I'm going to live or die. My cousin was just shot dead. My brother and father were just nearly shot dead and troops are closing in on our town. Please pray for me. And the time her letter reached me, her town had been burned to the ground. And I didn't know for the next 18 months if Medine was alive or dead. Uh, she and her, her mother and her sisters and another relative had pushed her father, and her disabled father in a wheelbarrow out um, as they fled into the forest. And I may tell more about that story um, in one of the subsequent days. But it was my friends who began to help me to think more globally about the needs of the rest of the world. But this passage already sets the tone for that. We have here an imperative surrounded by three subordinate participial clauses. The, the command is to make disciples of the nations, and we do so by going, by baptizing and by teaching, in a sense, cross-cultural evangelism and, and teaching. I'm probably going to focus more on the first element, on going, um, with the implication of going, since we're discipling the nations, going to the nations, partly because that's what people often talk about when they talk about missions, and partly because I may run out of time. But as we, as we look at these themes, we see these are not something that Matthew just springs on his audience at the end of his gospel, but this is something for which Matthew has prepared his audience all the way through. Um, how many of you are very good with math? You don't teach math in seminary? Well, does anybody know how many chapters come before chapter 28? You're not so bad at math. That's good. All right. 27 chapters, <clears throat> and Matthew has been preparing the way in the rest of the gospel for this climax at the conclusion of his gospel. In fact, he talks about going back in chapter 10, and that provides something of a model uh, at many points. Uh, we read about a sacrificial lifestyle, suffering persecution, signs of the kingdom, speaking about the kingdom, but there's one thing that's rescinded, and not just because it doesn't begin with S, and that's the geographic limitation. Basically, the disciples were, were limited by Jesus' instructions, pretty much to Galilee and in Jewish cities in Galilee. But that's been rescinded here at the end of the gospel. And that would be very striking for Matthew's, especially Jewish Christian audience. They had some good reasons not to like Gentiles. But Matthew is calling them, no matter how they feel about these other peoples, they are to, to go out and sacrifice and make disciples of all the nations to, to surmount any prejudices that they have. Now, this theme starts already in chapter 1, where you have Jesus' genealogy. Ancient genealogies normally didn't include women. And, and please don't look at me like I would include women. I'm just telling you, back then, they didn't normally include women. But the four women that Matthew includes are not the four you would expect. The famous matriarchs of Israel, like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and, and Leah, although you couldn't get Rachel and Leah both in the same genealogy. But he doesn't use the, the four famous matriarchs. Instead, we have Rahab. Uh, where was Rahab from? Ah, good. You're stronger on Bible than you are in math. Uh, Rahab was, was from Jericho. She was a Canaanite. Tamar was apparently a, a Canaanite as well. And then you have Ruth, who was a Moabite. Even though Deuteronomy 23.3 says an Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter the Lord's congregation of the 10th generation, she was welcomed in. She, she, she chose to follow the God of Israel. And then you have her that had been the wife of Uriah, Uriah the Hittite. So she may have been uh, Judean, uh, she may have been from Judah by birth, but she, she married into a Hittite family. So we have three ancestors of, of King David, the mother of King Solomon, all were either Gentiles or had Gentile associations. This is a, a great introduction to uh, 
the royal ancestry of Jesus in this gospel, introducing a major theme that's going to run throughout the gospel, particularly when you consider that one of the purposes of Jewish genealogies was to establish the purity of one's Israelite ancestry. Now in chapter two, we have these magi who come from the east, and magi were, were pagan astrologers. I mean, if, if you look at the, uh, the Greek text of Daniel, magi are, are people you would expect to be bad. They were enemies of, of Daniel. And yet three times the text says that they him who was king of the Jews. In contrast to them, you have Herod, the king of Judea, who ends up killing the male children of Bethlehem. Well, which, which king in the Old Testament tried to kill male children? Pharaoh. So here you have pagans who act like God's people, and you have the king of God's people who acts like a pagan king. It subverts the expectations and shows us that we can't predict in advance who may respond to the gospel, that we need to sow the seed everywhere. There is one other group there, the, uh, the scribes and the chief priests, who would be kind of the equivalent of ancient uh, seminarians, seminary professors like me, and so on, who were able to tell King Herod very quickly, you know, Herod's own wise men, where this child is going to be born. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, that's easy, Bethlehem, just six miles so the wise men from the east, they go to Bethlehem. And what do the ones who knew the Bible do? Apparently they don't do anything. It's one thing to know the Bible. It's another thing to obey the Bible. Take it seriously. Also, we see a number of other illusions that have to do with this going. In chapter, chapter 3 and verse 9, John the Baptist says to Jewish people who are coming to him, he says, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. In chapter 4, Matthew reminds us that Jesus' relocation fulfills a prophecy in Isaiah about Galilee of the Gentiles. Matthew chapter 8, we have a Roman army officer. Now, if there was any group of people that Jewish people hated as much as Canaanites, particularly Roman army officers. Ethnically, the man may have been Syrian. Most of the, most of the Roman troops in this area were, were from Syria, but he represents the power of Rome. And yet Jesus says that at the banquet with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom, many will come from the east like the Magi, many will come from the west like Rome, and sit down at table. We also have an example of deliverance in the Decapolis where Jesus casts out many demons from, from two possessed men in, in Matthew chapter 8. And the demons go into the pigs. Uh, we, we know it's primarily Gentile territory, especially because they're raising pigs. And this is also, by the way, where we get the expression deviled ham. <clears throat> in chapter 10, verse 15, and in, in chapter 11, verses 22 through 24, Saw Gomorrah, Tyre, and Sidon compare favorably with, with God's own people in the day of judgment. Again, in chapter 12, verses 41 and 42, Nineveh and Sheba will compare favorably with God's people in the day of judgment, with, with Capernaum and, and Chorazin, because those that had greater exposure to the truth would be judged more strictly. And Jesus is, is again emphasizing that the Gentiles too should be exposed to the message of the gospel. In fact, in chapter 10, he speaks of shaking the dust off your feet in these Galilean, if these Galilean towns don't respond to the gospel. And many times Jewish people would shake dust off their feet when leaving unclean territory or an unclean place, coming into a clean place so as to show that, yes, these places may be the places of, of God's people, the people who have the Torah, but it's not enough unless people respond. In chapter 16 and verse 13, where Jesus asks Peter the leading question, whom, where he asks his disciples the leading question, whom do you say that I am? And Peter confesses, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The place where he sets that up is at Caesarea Philippi, 
which was known as a pagan city. There was a, a grotto of Pan there that was very well known. Uh, witchcraft continued to be practiced there uh, for a, a great deal of time later after, until uh, the gospel changed that. Matthew chapter 25, the nations are judged according to how they received, uh, in my interpretation anyway, how they received the messengers of the good news. And in chapter 27, it's the Roman execution squad in light of the cross to confess Jesus as God's son. So it's not something that Matthew just springs on us at the end of his gospel. In fact, one of the most striking examples appears in chapter 15, where you have a Canaanite woman. Uh, you, you, we've already seen a couple Canaanites, uh, Rahab and Tamar. But here we have a Canaanite woman. Now in Mark, she's a Syrophoenician, a Greek. The Greeks were the ruling citizen class of Syrophoenicia. They were the kind of people who might be taking the bread out of other children's mouths. But now the shoe is on the other foot. Now she has to come and humble herself before Jesus. So there may be a, an element of a class issue involved as well as an ethnic issue. But this was also the region where some of the ancient Canaanites were driven. And so Matthew emphasizes that side of it, emphasizes the ethnic issue. The, the crossing ethnic boundaries. Jesus initially refuses her. He even compares her with a dog, which was a terrible insult in the ancient world. If you have my uh, New Testament background commentary, I'm... Hello? Hello. Hello, sir. Uh, who do I have the pleasure of speaking to? This is Gavagai. Are, are you an uh, atheist, Christian, or what's your position, sir, if you don't mind me asking? Atheist. Um, I, I'm doing a, a challenge tonight. You, uh, if anyone wants to give me 50, give 15 minutes of the time of, of giving me the arguments of why uh, they think I should maybe consider Christianity not being the truth. Uh, I just wondered if you'd like to take up that challenge. It's just a friendly. So basically, you'll have 15 minutes to share what you. Respond to you. We're not going to uh, argue or anything like that. I'm just going to respond, and then the next person, if they want to come, can have their 15 minutes. Okay, sure. Okay, bro. Go for it. All right. Um, well, I mean, I guess I would just relate to you the reasons that um, I uh, deconverted from Christianity. I, I was 30 years as a fundamentalist and a uh, Pentecostal Christian. Um, and I mean the the main reasons were um, one I I found that um, the things that were described in the Bible um, as far as uh, answers to prayer and um, miracles and those kinds of things uh, I had never experienced any of those things in the 30 years that I was a Christian. Uh, and, you know, as I talked with other believers and things, uh, there really weren't anything, any things that were miraculous that were, you know, could actually be verified or, or um, uh, I guess, substantively um, brought to evidence. Um, and then... Uh, the the other big reason that I, I deconverted from Christianity was just problems that I saw um, with biblical morality uh, in uh, the Old Testament and the Old Testament law. Uh, the fact that there were really very horrific things that that were carried out and done uh, that were allegedly commanded by the God of the Old Testament. Um, there's a, a significant gap between uh, the values and teachings of the Old Testament and, or as, as I see it, and the, and the teachings of the New Testament. Um, you know, when Jesus says, you know, love your neighbor as yourself, which, you know, is kind of a command that's buried in, in the Old Testament. Uh, but uh, alongside of that, there's all these, 
you know, commands to go out and kill everybody in this neighboring uh, land, and uh, including men, women, and children, and even sometimes animals and 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 things. And it just seems bizarre and very contradictory to loving your neighbor as yourself. Um, and then, uh, you know, kind of the I guess this the straw that broke the camel's back as far as just even not able to, to identify with the message of the gospel anymore uh, was the idea that people uh, would be burned for eternity in the fires of hell. Um, and, um, you know, that to me seemed cruel and, and uh, incommensurate with the uh, the lifetime that we have uh, Paul even describes the lifetime that we have as a vapor or a mist um, and yet we're going to be judged not even on what we've done but just on what we believe uh, and that to me seems seems wrong because you know it, according to the Bible everybody deserves this punishment uh, but the ones that escape it are just the ones who are lucky enough to either believe or or have you know? To, well, I guess first of all, to have heard the gospel message, and then secondly, uh, to have believed or been chosen to believe, or something like that. I mean, uh, depending on where you look and and kind of your framework, if you tend toward Calvinism or, or whatnot, uh, you know that breaks down differently too. So uh, I don't even need the 15 minutes. I guess that's that, that kind of sums up my major objections to. Uh, the Christian faith. Mm. Uh, so, sorry, your, na your name is again? Gavagai. Gavagai. All right, Gavagai. Yeah, run Gavagai run is my handle on here. Okay. Well, you sound a nice guy, Gavagai, and uh, I really appreciate what you shared there. And I appreciate the articulateness that you shared it and uh, the friendliness and, and the intelligence that you shared it. So, um, my answer to the first one about prayers, you haven't seen prayers, you haven't seen miracles. Um, my point there would be that um, that's just your own personal experience. Um, you know, you might not have seen it in your life, but other people claim that they've seen it in theirs. Uh, there's a book by uh, Craig Keener called Miracles, and he's done a lot of research which you might find of interest. Maybe we could read it together and chat about it. Uh, and he goes around the world collecting miracle claims and tries to deal with it in a fair, scientific kind of point of view. Um, he was. How, a, how do you spell the last name? Keener. Um, K, E, E, N, E, R. Okay. Uh, but if you're interested, uh, maybe we could have a look at it together, and maybe you could. Tell me what you think, and uh, we could discuss it. Because I think you find it interesting. Because you seem like a someone who, who's willing to look at both sides type of thing. So sure. Um, so that would make me response there is um, uh, no answers to prayer. Ross not seen any miracles. Um, about the biblical morality, that's a tough one. Um, a couple of things there that I would say is in order to claim some kind of objective moral high ground to the Old Testament. Uh, so, for example, you would say that you object to whatever has gone on, the massacres or anything like that. Um, you would have to have a, some kind of moral objective standard to be able to do that. If it's a subjective thing, where it's your opinion, then it's just your opinion. But if you're saying that you have an, a moral objective standard, then I would have to ask, well, where did that standard come from? And it's very difficult uh, from an atheist perspective to try and defend um, objective morality. Um, we can come back at that in a minute. Uh, yeah, that's a big subject. It's a big, it's a big subject. And the second thing I would say about that is, is. Um, yeah, it, it is a horrific in terms of uh, Israel going in, but there is a there is a 
the statement to Abraham. And God says to Abraham, look, I'm going to give you this plot of land, but when I'm going to give the, I think it's the Amorites, uh, 450 years to repent. So the nations around uh, Canaan had 450 years to, to repent. And unfortunately, when you're in war, it affects everybody. And so they had these 450 years, and they didn't repent, and they were in war. And yet it was ugly. But that's the context. It's Israel's sword of the sword of God is Israel on those nations. And about the contradictions between the Old and New Testament. In terms of morality with the Old Testament, um, Jürgen Herbermas, who's uh, one of the most brilliant scholarly atheists in the world today, is on record of stating, um, and I can get the reference from. Uh, I post it underneath uh, later today. Um, but he's on record as stating that the Old Testament um, and Christianity has been a foundation, uh, has been the foundation for Western morality. Uh, so whether you agree with it or not, it has given the the idea of respect for 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 individuals, the idea of um, people are valuable, is something that. Gave the West gave a moral foundation in the West from Christianity. Uh, so that's from a, a leading academic atheist. In um, the New Testament, well, Christianity, uh, the Christian faith is a, is a revelation over history, and you know there is there is in that revelation of history the seed and the tree. At the beginning, we get what is called the Proto-Evangel. Uh, right at the beginning, you can even see the Gospel uh, proclaimed to Adam and Eve when they sinned. You know, God gives, gives them covering, and then he gives there's a statement about you will bruise the serpent. So even there, there's this little seed that God is going to send uh, a Redeemer. And you even see in Job, where Job, the book of Job, one of the earliest books in the Old Testament, where he says, I know my Redeemer liveth. And so in the Old Testament, there's this seed of there will be a Redeemer, and then the New Testament, it, it's fulfilled. So what that means is when we say there's a contradiction, we have to remember that it's a, a progressive revelation. And, uh, and, you know, uh, and if we see it in that light, so what that means is, if it's a progressive revelation, there are certain things, for example, where there are laws where you shouldn't eat seashells or whatever, um, and things like that. They were for a particular time, for a particular purpose. But you've got to understand it in why, how it fits in the general overall revelation, the, the overall history of it. It's all pointing to the Messiah coming. Um, the issue about hell... Um, I can understand the way you feel about uh, from a, a practical human perspective, but if we've tried, if you try to get your mind around the perspective of the Bible, um, in Isaiah chapter six, Isaiah says, "Holy, holy, holy, Lord God Almighty." There, in that chapter, and you know, we have to get our understanding that how great God is, and and the issue of God is his, is his holiness, um, and that ho a holy God can't have sin in his presence. And he's such a great holy God that when we sin, it has infinite consequences. Now, we as, you as an atheist or people might say, well, we, I don't know God, I don't have a knowledge of God, I don't believe there's any evidence for God. But from the biblical perspective, um, if you read... Uh, um, Acts chapter 17 when Paul goes to the philosophers he talks about creation and he talks about conscience and, and he talks about Christ three C's but he says even your own poets have said there is the unknown God even and you know even in academic philosophy even in um, even in science it's, well, some atheists even Dawkins has said that there is something quite profound, something quite deep, even mystical, to the universe. And and in a way, that is like Paul when he said, pointed to the philosophers, to the unknown God. So there is this transcendence that
that we we can all feel even if we're an atheist that points to something deeper than what we can sense just in the physical and so what I would say is that we have a sense there is a God and we're all accountable and we don't realize how great God is and so when we sin it has infinite consequences and that's why God had to come down in Jesus Christ that's why the sacrifice had to be infinite when Christ died on that cross it was an infinite sacrifice dealing for infinite sin now all this issue about Calvinism and Arminianism and God choosing and all the rest of it the thing is scripture is bigger than Calvinism and it's bigger than if you read scripture uh, there is a mystery there there is a mystery and I'm not afraid to say there's a mystery even in uh, physics there are mysteries there, there is a boundary of the unknowable even in any scientific knowledge and the boundary of the unknowable here is how the divine and and the undivine can meet at a point in history uh, and God in some way human beings can be brought to a relationship with him um, by the power of the Holy Spirit uh, so those are my thoughts bro um, I was going to give 15 minutes 15 minutes I'll let you come back if you want to come back at me and yeah, you go. yeah I mean it was a lot and I know I, I kind of covered uh, shotgun <laughs> of uh... Good. I like I like your style though I, I, I could tell you're a nice guy though well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to think of myself as a nice guy. Um, I mean, so, I don't know. If, is there one of those issues that you would like to hear my response yeah, to? Yeah, whatever, whatever you want to give a response. And then I've got a few things I'd like to say about things that you didn't cover, which I'd be interested to hear. But, yeah, if you, if you want to come back at me on those things, feel free. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess... Let's take the last, the last issue. I mean, the sense that that a lot of us have that you know there's something kind of deeper, more profound, or transcendent about the world or whatever. I can I can kind of identify with that, and if I didn't, I don't think I would have been a Christian for the 30 years of my life that I was. Yeah. Um, and I don't count when. You know, I, I count maybe from when I was about five years old or so, uh, when I started to be able to, in on some level, uh, begin to comprehend the ideas and things. But um, the when I when I go back and look at the Bible and what it says and things, that kind of sense of justice and and right and wrong. Um, that sense within me condemns what I'm reading, um, and so it's it's really hard for me to say, okay, well, this sense is from a being that, you know, inspired this text, uh, if that makes sense. Because uh, if if the being put that sense in in me, then it also the sense that it put in me uh, condemns what I'm reading. So that doesn't quite make sense to me. Um, and and it could be that my sense of, of justice and right and wrong is skewed, um, but when I take that and go, you know, and apply what it, what I, you know, that that sense in me uh, into the world around me, um, it it corresponds. and values uh, I, you know I, I, I probably conflict with Christians on the issue of, of same-sex marriage I, I myself am a heterosexual I'm married I've been faithful to my wife for uh, some close to 20 years now yeah. uh, you know and I value I value my marriage my relationship and I, I I'm, like I said I'm faithful uh, but I, I still believe that people who uh, have that tendency and they they are attracted to members of the same sex, I fully uh, am willing to allow them the same kinds of of uh, love and relationship that I experience, you know, within the uh, connections that they make. Um, and, and I would, I'm sure I would differ there. But as far as myself, I don't participate in that because it's not something that even appeals to me at all. Um, so, 
I don't know. I, 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 I coming back to you. Uh, I, I can understand where you're coming from about reading some passages in the Bible, and I can understand that your sense of justice when you read it, it doesn't quite chime with the justice that you're seeing in the Bible. I can understand that, and I think that that's one of the things about the Bible is it makes you uncomfortable uh, in the sense that sometimes you read it and your own value system kind of thinks, well, this, this just doesn't seem right. And then sometimes you read the Bible and it challenges your own value. Have I got it right? And that's, that's the Bible. The Bible is not meant to be a comfortable book. It's not meant to be a book where you sit in your little armchair and it gives you all these answers. It's a book, it's a book given to you to, for you to grapple. And uh, you know, so when you come when you come to these issues where it makes you uncomfortable because you don't agree with the value system that you see there, that's then for you to grapple with it more. That's that's how I find that's how uh, you know you, that that's how that's how the Bible is to be approached. And uh, I found over twenty years in studying the Bible that. Um, I've had the same attitude as you, even as a Christian, there are things that I've read and I thought, hang on a minute, that doesn't chime well with the way I think. But as I grapple with these things, as I study and as I, as I grapple, and I grow in my understanding, then I, I begin to understand. But these things aren't easy, that sometimes they're not meant to be easy. Life's messy, and very often the Bible presents life as messy. You know, like for example, Abraham has two wives, it's pretty messy. Solomon has a thousand concubines, that's a pretty messy thing. You know, and it, the, the Bible just doesn't wrap you up in a little cocoon as if life's all nicely, everything's tied nicely and neat. So, that, so what I would say is they're there for you to grapple with and think through it, and if you're intellectually honest, you will grapple with those issues. The second thing I'd like to say is um, it on the issue of gay marriage and things like that, it's an issue of authority. Uh, it's where your authority it lies. Uh, if you think authority lies in reason, then you will come up with various ideas that you have and maybe other people might have different ideas. Right? There are postmodernists and there are modernists, there are all sorts of different ideas about morality. Uh, so you can use reason. Uh, if you use reason, the problem with using pure reason is it does tend to break down into eventually into morality be begin breaks down into relativism. Eventually, uh, it will break down into that. And somewhere along the line, it will be hard to talk about objective morality so when you say you appreciate you when you talk about the words like love when you talk about uh, you might not be into gay marriage but you you know you, what you're saying is you you value and respect that these are you know if, when you talk about these kind of values as if they have some kind of objective validity then when you're using reason under scrutiny, it will not be able to develop an objective morality. Um, so you might say, well, you know, we can do it by uh, science, but then, you know, if, if you wanted to go into that, we could break objective morality down uh, using science down. Um, uh, if you say that it's uh, by the, you know, by contract, uh, like. Um, uh, Sh uh, Shelley Segan or somebody at, um, at Harvard, is it Harvard, um, who debated William Wayne Craig a few years ago, uh, who has a kind of idea about you can have objective morality based on a contract system, um, but you know different contracts can have different different ideas, or you could have a society that is the majority like utilitarianism, but then again there'll be other societies that will take it to get objective morality from reason, pure reason. Then the other way is experience. Uh, so you have like the philosopher Kierkegaard who, uh, and people like Jean-Paul Sartre who uh, was saying, well Jean-Paul Sartre you know, was saying that 
just act, just be, exercise your your will. Um, so that's experience. The problem with that is, is if you can't rationalize your experience, you're in danger of having an experience that isn't rational. Uh, so we were, there were there were uh, students in the 60s that were taking on board existentialism, like Jean Paul Sartre, and they were saying they were having these experiences to act, but they couldn't rationalize. Um, Carl Jasper's a, a existentialist philosopher, and stu his students they couldn't rationalize what their experience was. And then the other way of 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 morality is religious text and revelation and um, some of those texts, uh, i.e., uh, the Quran and other religious texts, uh, can be used for all sorts of wrong uh, political purposes or whatever. Um, Christianity is a, is ultimately a revelation uh, from from the Bible, uh, and that is the source for a Christian the the authority, reason, and experience submit to that to that revelation. So what I would say is the debate about what is true morally and what is not, is, you, you know, you're welcome to disagree, but I think the key is authority. Who's authority? Who has authority? And we're not going to agree on that authority, but I'm just saying it's where the authority lies. And for a Christian, the authority lies in the Bible. So my experience uh, submits to the Bible, and if the Bible tells me that morality is uh, through through a man and a woman, um, my reason will accord with that, and my conscience. But I have I submit to that because I believe that that is the revelation. So when you say you 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 value not in your words, but if you value gay marriage and whatever, you, I I can't in all conscience. From the Bible, um, I can say I value them as human beings. I love them as human beings. I value whatever they're doing individually, but I can't, I can't countenance, I can't uh, support that. Um, I'm not saying I'm not saying that is right. I'm not saying that is wrong. I'm just saying at the moment the issue is authority. That wherever you side on authority, morality then you will come to a certain conclusion. Here, yeah, there, bro. Hello? I don't know where you are, bro, but I, I was really enjoying that. Um, that's You're still on there, bro. Uh, your connection seemed to be a bit bad uh, I couldn't hear you on the last bit so I don't know where you are uh, it might be your connection but um, I'm going to put Keena on uh, if you if you come back uh, bro just let me know if anybody else wants to come and have 15 minutes uh, to share feel free uh, but thank you uh, I can't pronounce it Gavige <laughs> Uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I, I would really respect you. Uh, you know, it's refreshing to talk to someone like you who is so open to dialogue and who is so uh, friendly and willing to uh, discuss. Uh, really appreciate that. Okay, I'm going to listen to Keena. If anybody else wants to come on for 15 minutes and give me the arguments of why I should abandon Christianity. Uh, I would really appreciate that. Uh, I really enjoyed it with this man. He was really great. Oh, he's back. <laughs> if your connection comes on, Gavine, Gav, Gavigi, <laughs> uh, just chime in, bro. I don't know what it is. It just seems to be a bad connection. How, can oh. you hear me now? Oh, yeah. Hey, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think I hit mute on my headset. I, <laughs> oh. I kept trying every other... I was busted. I thought this guy. I like this guy. It is. Well, sorry bro. about that. A any thoughts? What? Yeah. Well. So. Okay. I mean, we we talked about about same sex marriage. Now that's an issue where I, I would be open to it, uh, but you would be against it based on 
um, biblical, you know, text and scripture. Um, Gavin, Gavin, did you did you? Is it okay if I call you Gavin? Yeah, yeah. You can call me Run too. A lot of people just call me Run. Okay, Run. Um, did you hear what I said about authority? Did I, that... I did. Yes. All right. Okay, go on, Run. Yeah, I was I was listening the whole time, and then the, you came to the end, and I was trying to talk, but I've I've muted myself apparently on on my headset rather than on the you know controls on the in the hangout there, and so I was confused as to how to <laughs> turn myself back on there. But um, so the one of the things that uh, occurred to me as you were talking was well, um, to me. Slavery seems like an issue where we, we probably I'm sure you're not pro slavery, right? Yeah. Um but to me it seems like the Bible allows for that. Um which is another, you know, issue or problem that I see with the Bible is that uh both in the Old Testament, uh it is as an institution it is endorsed uh, or at least, you know, allowed. Um, I just did a video today uh, where I kind of went through all the, the passages in the Old Testament and, and even some in the New Testament. Um, and then in the New Testament, it is, again, you know, it's never condemned and said, well, this is bad. Um, okay, can I go back to you? And if you read the, if you go into Christian Think Tank, uh, he's done uh, uh, a lot of work on this. Uh, so if you go and study his stuff, he's very helpful. But there's four types of slavery in the Old Testament. <laughs> Um, so when you're talking about slavery in the Old Testament, it's not it's not like you you can't just approach it in in terms of the way we think in our modern times about slavery. Um, you go if you study those four types of slavery. For example, if you were a slave and you ran off, you the owner could not go and get you back. Were the slaves in shackles? No, they weren't. They weren't in shackles. They, How do you know that? Well, there's nothing in the text that would suggest that. Well, but, that's but, typically what's associated with slavery, yeah, right? Yeah, but that's that's the point, Gavin. You're you're bringing in our modern understanding back into that ancient time. What I'm what I'm what I'm saying. The the main point here is all I'm saying is that there's four. There's about four types of different slavery. And when you look at those types, they okay. don't. They don't come into the category of land slavery in the deep south. They don't. So, for example, I'm just giving you an example. Um, the slave, if the, the, the person ran away or left the master because the master was harsh in any way, uh, the master could not go and get that person. Now, that does not comport with our idea of slavery. Once you are a slave, you are the... You are the persons you are the owner, right? So that's the f first thing. The second thing is in the old, in the New Testament, it's an issue of how you deal with political power. In Christianity, you do not destroy political power by a political re revolution. You, the way to destroy political power from a Christian perspective, is by implosion rather than explosion. So, for example. The way to undermine the political structures in the Roman Empire, Christian perspective, is Christ on the cross. When Christ came, what did he do? Did he did he did he walk into Jerusalem with uh, a, a mighty army like like uh, like uh, Muhammad did into Mecca? No, he, he he took on the Roman Empire by dying on a cross. And that is the Christian way to undermine any social structures that are evil. So Paul says to the says to masters, masters, treat your slaves as you would be treated. And but it doesn't say free them. No, but no, but the point is, if you treat your master, if you treat your slave as you would tr be treated, they are free. So you've you've imploded. You, so if you read Philemon, you know it's clear. That that's how the social structure. If, if if for example in Paul's time, if Paul said, and he said, and if this happened anywhere, uh, in any social structure, evil, look, revolt. Every slave would have been massacred. Every slave would have been killed. The way to the way it was undermined 
is the fact that when cr Christians were treating their slaves as, as family, was treating them as free, and that's how it was undermined because they were people. The the people were not just uh, commodities, but they were people made in the image of God and had dignity, and that's how Paul and how the New Testament undermined it. So when you say, when you're saying that Christianity um, advocates slavery, when you read the New Testament, what it's saying there, and it's very clear that human beings are equal, and therefore the slave master must treat the, the slave as... So you don't treat your slave as a slave, you treat them as you want to be treated. So, for example, if you read the book of James, um, it's quite clear there, you know, in, in Roman society, the rich were the privileged, and James says, you know, you're treating uh, the poor, you, you're not talking to the poor, you're not spending time with poor, the poor, you, you're treating the rich as more privileged, and James is saying, no, you know, you treat the poor uh, as the same as you would treat the rich, and that's always been Christianity. So when you're when you're reading into it and you're saying that the New Testament supports slavery, I would say personally it doesn't. That's how I would say it. Well, the 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 slave owners in the South and and any you know in in Western Christian civilization pointed to uh, both Old and New Testament in support of of slavery for more than a thousand years. Well, if they'd have read Albert Barnes, Albert Barnes was a 19th century uh, theologian, and Albert Barnes wrote uh, a, a magnus, magnus opus, a massive, brilliant uh, work on slavery in the Bible. I would encourage you to read it. It's called Slavery of the Bible by Albert Barnes. Okay. And if you read that book, uh, it's an amazing book. You, you go through all the text. The the point there is is that it is about any any text or any um, any ideology or any understanding is that there'll always be people who misunderstand the message. Even in Marxism, there'd be people off message in Marxism. Even it's part of the human condition that we're fallen human beings, and you know, we, we because of our backgrounds, because of our social conditioning, because of politics, because of all different kind of flows within history, we're frail human beings, and we we get the wrong end of the stick. So some people uh, looked at the Bible and they took. A wrong turning on their exposition, but you've got to say that some people read the Bible and they took the right turning. So, for example, if you look at William Wilberforce and uh, the the Clapham sect, um, Hannah More, a great playwright uh, in the 17th century, and uh, uh, Countess of Huntington, uh, a very wealthy aristocrat, people like that. That there were some people that um, that. Uh, took the right turning and led the way. It so, took, a, took a long time, right? And and it wasn't explicit in the text. I mean, that's part of the problem for me is, is that it's written in such a way that you can pretty much defend uh, a lot of different positions. I mean, and that's part of the reason why we have so many different denominations and, and, and there's been... Uh, you know, progression and progressive interpretation as we've marched through history um, as to what it all means. But, but that's part of the human condition. I mean, in the Enlightenment, there, you know, in today's today's scholarship about the Enlightenment, there are different schools of thought about the Enlightenment. Hegelian philosophy at the time of after Hegel, there was the right wing Hegelians and the left wing Hegelians. That's just the way human beings are. We're all when you know, we the the hum, human beings are frail, and human beings will get the wrong end of the stick on somebody's teaching, somebody's ideas. For example, um, you know, Jesus died on a cross, and he, he he rose again. This he said before he died. He, he in John, he, he he washed the disciples' feet, and he says, "Just as I I've done this to you, you do it to others." Now. Take that, take that uh, uh, run, and then compare it. What happened in the Crusades? 
there's a clear teaching about what Jesus said we to be, and then you a apply that to the crusade, and it was not applied, and that's just part of the way the human condition is, and you can take that for Islam, you can take that for atheism, you can take, I could take you take you to the history of atheism and I could show you our groups of atheists took the wrong end of, end of the stick and applied atheism in a wrong way. For example, uh, there are people in, in uh, you know, um, Peter Hitchens in his in his book, um, I just, I just, I've got it here, The Rage, The Rage Against God. If you read that, you know, there were, you know, there was he was a, uh, a reporter uh, in uh, in Russia, and so knows a lot about communism. And there were there were uh, pol political leaders uh, saying that um, you know, try people who have Christmas trees in the, in their houses tell them that they don't need to have Christmas trees, that there isn't a God, and you know Jesus isn't didn't exist, and things like that. And so that, those are obviously. Uh, people who were atheists who got the wrong end of the stick in, and got into politics and then applied it in the wrong way. But does that, you know, so that's what I'm saying is part of the human condition, mate. That's what I think. That doesn't mean to say there isn't truth. It doesn't mean to say there isn't truth. But I'm just saying that, you know, we're all on a journey. There'll be things in your life and there'll be things in my life where I'll be off message and you'll be off message. Well, you'll be on the right message on some things, and I'll be on the right message. But there'll be some things, and things you, and it's a, and it's a learning process. I, I suppose the difference, though, is that if I were uh, an all-powerful deity who was trying to communicate with, uh, you know, a, a group of people, I would make sure that my message was was n was not being interpreted poorly uh, and when it was I would do what I could to make sure that it uh, you know that it was clear what I was trying to, to say okay. to communicate okay you're an honest guy right in your uh, honest on it run and I know I know you're going to be honest and I know you're going to be fair but if you was to read John 316 if me and you were to read it we could both generally get the idea uh, even though we're from two different backgrounds, we could both probably get the idea that John 3.16 is about some kind of salvation issue. Yeah. You know, about God's salvation. <laughs> yeah? we, you, you, you would agree with that. Now, so we could, so that's the basic message there. But now if someone read, if me and you read the book of Revelation about the, pro, you know, about the end times, uh, we're both pro probably going to get a different understanding of it. But yeah, that basic message about salvation, we probably both understand what it's about, about God sending his son and stuff like that. So what I'm saying is, so, so I'm just saying that, that, you know, the message is simple uh, in, in terms of the basic message. There are things where in the Bible, like prophetic books, where it's difficult uh, to understand because, it, it, you know, a lot of people uh, don't really... Uh, study the Bible, and even if they study the Bible, they might use wrong methods of interpreting. But that doesn't mean to say the message, the basic message, that they can't understand it. The second thing is, is it's not just the message; it's receivers of the message. Even Thomas Hobbes, if you look at the philosophy of law, which I've just been reading recently, most of the philosophers of law and and philosophers about uh, the state and how we're to do law, for example, uh, philosophers like Hobbes and Locke and people like that, what I find interesting is how cynical they were about human nature, that they believed that human nature was essentially selfish and, you know, we, we need laws and, and checks and balances to put this selfishness in check. And I would say that a lot of this misinterpretation of the Bible and, every, and in every other movement or group is down to a human nature being fallen, and and because it's fallen, it will get the wrong end of the stick sometimes. That's what I think. Yeah. yeah there's a lot there. Um, you know, so another thing that has related to this kind of idea that man is corrupt, and and um, you know, we would we. Uh, come into power, we we get corrupted. Even if we, you know, before we came to power, we were decent people. Um, 
looking at the way that the Hebrew laws and Hebrew society was structured, you know, supposedly by this all-knowing deity, it doesn't seem like that was taken into account. Um, you know, you look at the uh, at the law and then the the system of judges that was put in place. Uh, the judges were were corrupt and and the people complained about them and and there was kind of a, a lot of uh, there was a lot of bad stuff going on um, in, in the in the time of the judges um, and then when they asked for a king hoping that that would you know correct things uh, the prophet Samuel was saying well oh you know they're rejecting God because this is the system that he put in place but it wasn't working because the judges were corrupt for the very reason that you've stated that you know has been observed by all of these uh, political thinkers you know from way back <laughs> um, you know why would why would the the deity not have put into place a more um, a system that was I guess more accommodating to the fact that uh, we do need checks and balances that we uh, you know we need people to uh, watch out and, and hold us accountable when we when we have any kind of power over other people uh, very very good question Gavi I think um, I don't fully I don't pretend Gavi to uh, run for to fully um, willing to listen to you whatever you say as well you know so you want to come back at me and say stuff uh, from my, my perspective from what I understand bro um, a couple of things and uh, one is um, that right at the beginning when Adam and Eve fell I mentioned um, before in this video somewhere I don't know if it was to you or before about the proto-evangel so when Adam and Eve fell God gave them a covering and then he talked about you will bruise the serpent's head and that is what theologians call the proto-evangel. That is a little uh, prophecy that one day the Messiah, there would be a, a Redeemer coming and there would be a Savior. So when, when you see God bringing Israel into the Promised Land and when you see Israel failing, when you see in Israel failing, um, God is trying to show is that human ingenuity, human ability is never going to fully cut it. And so when you read the book, you know, when you read uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of years of history in the book of Kings and you see king after king after king after king coming and king after king failing, people who've had great education, people who've had everything given to them, like Solomon, and yet they fail. And, and so God is showing there that you know, by man's ability, man will not build a kingdom. And until the Messiah comes, until he comes with a new kingdom, and there will be an everlasting kingdom, that's the only time that that, that there will be a proper society where, where everything will be okay. So you, the utopia that man can build will never be able to be, build, be built. And so, for example... Interesting at the turn of the 19th, at the end of the 19th century, into the going into the 20th century, the mantra was, "We will build a, a new Jerusalem. We will build a perfect world." And then we had the first world war, then we had the second world war, and the utopian dreams of humanity were smashed. The third thing I want to say is, Christianity uh, has two two things. It talks about the state, Jesus says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar. So the state has has a role in restraining sin. The state has a, a role to, to do that. But then Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And what that means is you're born from above. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells in your heart. So the way for society to change is not just the political outward stuff. There is this renewal with inside, and, and Christianity, you know, in the Roman Empire when Christianity came on the scene, it was decaying, and Christianity brought a renewal from within, from within within humanity, get, giving a, a regeneration of the heart to human beings, and lifted humanity out of the degradation 
of of a collapsing Roman Empire. So what I would say is that three things. Number one, God was already planning the Messiah to come, showing that polit politics will fail. Number two, um, that man's utopia would has been shown to fail. And number three, that God's answer ultimately is to renew human beings through being born again. Politics is important and valuable, but it's never going to fully solve the issue unless people's hearts are changed, and we're not going to see a change. Okay. Um, you know, the, the I, I can I can understand what you're saying, but the you know the system of the judges was was the system that was put in place um, by by Moses and and ostensibly by Yahweh himself. Um, so, to me, if if that was the, the best, the ideal situation, um, we should see even, uh, you know, secular societies kind of going toward that just for the fact of, you know, uh, empirically that that would be the better system. But, you know, we, we don't see that. I mean, we see judges in place, but the judges are are held accountable they're not you know in a lot of cases they're not appointed for life and things they they're uh, in some cases elected in other cases they're they're appointed and but they can be pulled out and um, they don't have a final word there's a there's a process for appeals and things like that um, all of these things that that we have in in modern Western societies and things I think are are better than what was put in place you know, originally uh, in the Old Testament, um, and I'm just left with question marks saying, well, why wouldn't this other system that's different, that was supposedly given by uh, an all-knowing being, be superior to what we've kind of come up with on our own? Okay, Ron, but what, what's interesting here uh, in this conversation, Ron, is all the conversation is, is principally, not all of it, but most of it, is about the Old Testament and you know I think you're making a big mistake when you're saying that when you're trying to say well what we have now uh, is better than the Old Testament because Christianity is based on the Old Testament but we are we are in the New Covenant now not the Old Covenant in Jeremiah 31 Jeremiah talks about a New Covenant and so the Old Testament is valuable and has many lessons for us to learn. Uh, for example, the Ten Commandments are, are for, all, for, for, for all time. But there are many things in the Old Testament, like there, are priests, uh, there, were high, there was a high priest in the Old Testament. Uh, Jesus is the final high priest. Uh, Moses was not only a leader, he was a prophet. Jesus is the final prophet. So many of the things of the Old Testament are fulfilled in Christ. Uh, and in Christ, we should be thinking about, you know, when when you make the argument, if you made the argument run, what we have now is better than Jesus Christ, then that would be against Christianity. But when you're saying what we have now is better than the Old Testament, then it, to to be honest, you misrepresent in Christianity. Christianity is not Judaism. Christianity is based in Judaism. It's part of Judaism. Uh, Jesus is a Jew, but it's not rooted solely in the Old Testament. It's rooted in the Old Testament, but it's also rooted and founded on, on Jesus Christ and the New Testament. And I think you're making a category, category mistake there, bro. Well, but I'm not, I'm not saying even the religion. I'm just saying, uh, look, here was an opportunity for uh, a deity to kind of show off in a way that wasn't massacring people, that wasn't, <laughs> um, you know, doing something kind of horrific, which a lot of a lot of the Old Testament does. But this is a way that he could show, okay, this is something, uh, an innovative government uh, and, and legal system that was more just than the surrounding 
uh, cultures um, that was innovative in that it it put in place um, checks and balances and and made leadership accountable uh, because we we recognize that humans are corruptible and 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 corrupt corrupted when they are put in power um, you know but but we don't see that you know we we see a system of judges that weren't didn't have that kind of accountability. Um, and then we see a, a system of kings that replaced that because that wasn't working and the people were complaining. Um, and then the kings were corrupt and things. So it's it's a, the, the initial failed system that was, you know, s similar to, you know, some of the situations um, and surrounding nations and things. Uh, and it didn't seem... I don't see any reason to believe that it was so innovative or insightful into human nature that, that it had to have come from uh, a deity. I think, to me, it makes more sense to look at it and say, this is the work of, of human hands and human thinking that's representative of the time where they lived and the place where they lived. Okay, well, a couple of things. Well, you say it would be a great opportunity for a, a deity to show... Uh, his glory or, or his splendor or whatever. Well, the, one of the things in, in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy, I mean, a couple of things. Number one is the Ten Commandments. Um, that was that was something that God wanted the Jewish, the, the people of God to focus on. And in turned up as love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So, God reminded human beings that Ba that's the basics. I mean, even Solon, who was uh, a Greek uh, philosopher and political thinker, who uh, some atheist scholars in the past have pointed to as a, a paragon of virtue, and and um, who who stated the golden rule, uh, was actually a person who, behind the political scenes, uh, was getting people assassinated and stuff like that. But the the point is that you know Solon. Solon uh, saw the need for the golden reel even though he didn't actually practice it. The point one I'm trying to get at is the Ten Commandments is always going to be relevant. The idea of loving your neighbor as yourself, even you, you and I both, I'm sure, would agree to that st standard. The second thing I want to say is, um, you know, one of the things about the Old Testament is the is the high priesthood and the Day of Atonement. You know, once a year they had the Day of Atonement, and there they would sacrifice the lambs and they would sacrifice uh, the animals, and Israel's sin was put on the animals, and they would have an escape go. And in in the midst of that, there were stories like where uh, Moses lift up the staff, and anybody who looked at the staff wouldn't be bitten by the serpent. Uh, in the book of Genesis, you have stories where uh, Jesus, uh, where uh, Abraham um, was told to sacrifice his son, and uh, and then told not to, and then given a ram. Now the ram uh, to be sacrificed uh, by Abraham, uh, it, Moses holding up the staff, the high priest sacrificing the animals. All these are pointing to the final sacrifice. God is saying, look, you've got all these ideas about how to solve society, politics, and, and all the rest of it. But you know the deepest problem with you human beings is your heart, that your heart's not right. And until your heart's right with me, you're not going to get anywhere. And that is the splendor of God, that he, right at the beginning in the time of Israel, was pointing to... Jesus and Jesus would come and be the final sacrifice for our sin. So the answer to your problem and my problem politically is my heart and your heart. And all, like I said, all like you said about these failed systems. Uh, well, you know, again, you you you're making a, the mistake of misunderstanding what the Old Testament is about. It's part of a progressive revelation. It was never meant to be a perfect model. It was a shadow of things to come in. Um, run, please get if you get a chance, just read the book of Hebrews, and I, and and it and it talks about the Old Testament is a shadow. It's pointing to eternal things, spiritual things. 
So sac everything that you know the high priest when the high priest in the Old Testament when he was sacrificing he had garments on. If you do a study of those garments, every one of them was symbolic of it of eternal spiritual things. If you go in, if you do a study of the tabernacle in the time of Moses and what was in the tabernacle and why it was there, they were all symbols of the heavenlies. And so if you read the book of Hebrews, you'll get an understanding of that. That you know they were not meant to be perfect models uh, in the Old Testament. They were meant to be uh, shadows of eternity. Uh, point in terms of it. and if you read the book of Hebrews you get that the, fo the other thing as well there are lots of different lessons that you can learn for example a president or a prime minister about if they studied the life of David or the life of Moses about leadership for example Moses killed someone and took things into his own hands and uh, went into the desert and had to learn humility and if you're going to be a leader, you've got to have humility. You can learn lots of great lessons in modern times from these uh, great leaders of the past. Yeah. Well, and so one of the things that I've uh, kind of spoken on and, and, and written about in my blog and on, in my, on my channel um, are the stories of, of David and then the story of Achan from is it in jo it's in the book of Joshua. Uh, you're familiar with Achan, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he's he's stoned to death uh, along with all of his family uh, because he stole from one of their defeated enemies, and um, and and that was allowed sometimes and not allowed other times. Uh, and <clears throat> and so this man and his whole family were stoned to death. Um, whereas David, um, who did several things that were universally wrong, not not okay in some situations and not you know uh, disallowed in other situations, but he he committed adultery, um, he you know conspired and committed murder and and tried to deceive, um, you know all of these things that you know were very serious issues. Um, he was not stoned to death. His family was not stoned to death. He didn't even lose power. Um, and when you know, when I, I actually was still kind of struggling and on the fence about my faith and things. Um, I sat in a Sunday school class, uh, you know, in an adult Bible study where they looked at both of those stories side by side, and I thought, um, you know, both of these judgments allegedly were, you know, handed down from from Yahweh himself uh, through the prophet um, Nathan in one case and through the leader Joshua in the other case. Um, so if it's the same being that is uh, kind of distributing justice in, in both of these situations, um, and on the one hand there's a peon, a nobody, um, who by all purposes, you know, uh, you know, if you if you actually read the story, it seems very much like he is the scapegoat for a really bad military uh, decision that was made by by Joshua, and and poor Achan and his family get the brunt of the you know the, the bad end of the stick on it, um, and then David, who is in power, um, is you know, has done something really bad, w much worse than what Aiken did, yeah. uh, as far as, you know, lives lost and, um, you know, all of these things. Um, and yet, and yet he he's, stays in power. And I, I thought to myself, if, if this was a modern situation where the leader got away with this um, and and another guy who was just a peon was, you know, brutally killed like this for a crime that was, you know, and, and he was, a, you know, by all accounts, just a soldier in the army. Um, you know, if, if that happened today, we would be outraged because okay. it's, it's not just, because it's, it's so incommensurate uh, one with the other. Okay, the, the, prob the couple of problems with what you're saying there, Run, we're not, we're not talking about modern society. We're talking about a holy eternal about so you well, has justice changed wait wait a minute let, let me finish bro 
we're talking about a holy, eternal God. So when you sin, when I sin, it's in relation to God. So when you're talking about modern society, you're talking in relation to modern society. We're talking about in relation to God. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, is um, with Achan and with David, you're talking about there seems to be an inconsistency there. A couple of things. Number one, the issue of repentance. It's very clear in the life of David, for all his hypocrisy, that he did repent. You read Psalm 51 after he slept with Bathsheba. He cries out to God. And in fact, um, um, Prophet Nathan challenged him and said, you're the man, and he actually repented. Now, yeah, but we don't get I to don't hear the side of the story. No, but that's, but that's the point. That's the point, is we don't see whether he did or didn't. We, what we see is a swift judgment on him. But what I'm saying is it's very clear, and so you can't argue from silence. But I can argue from something very clear. David clearly repented. And so therefore, there is a difference there between him and Achan. Right? Secondly, secondly about that is, is that um, is God's judgment as well. Is that, you know, sometimes God judges swiftly. And so, for example... Uh, you know, Achan is taken out and he's, he's just swiftly. For David, even though he repents, he doesn't get away with it. Because in the end, Absalom son rebels against him. And he, David is kicked out of his own kingdom. He's, he's, you know, and next thing you know, because of this rebellion by Absalom, Absalom ends up getting in a, a battle with David's troops and Absalom dies. And it says that David goes, Absalom, Absalom, oh my son, Absalom, and his heart's broken. So his, his sin with Bathsheba led in the end to his son rebelling against him, and then his son uh, ended up getting killed. So there was a consequences to his sin. So how God, how God wants to judge, you know, some nations, he doesn't judge them quickly. He gives them hundreds of years of opportunity to repent. Some nations, he comes down swiftly and... And it's up to God uh, how he wants to bring that, that judgment. And if he wants to give people time, he's a, he, he can give people time. Uh, I think that the, is, it was serious because, you know, he was deceiving everybody. And that was affecting the military camp, campaign. Whereas David, in the end, allowed himself to be exposed, allowed himself... To, to bring everything to the open. Whereas Aiken kept it secret and he was discovered and that affected the military outcome of Israel. And it, and it happened in the New Testament where Ananias and Sapphira were also secret um, and, and deceit, deceitful and it says they just dropped, they just dropped dead. And, and not, so, so there's something there where God takes it seriously if you're deceiving if you are deceiving in, in in the house of God and you keep it deceived and it's affecting the house of God, that that there can be serious consequences. We're not we're not messing around with nuclear bombs here. We're not messing around society. We're messing around with God, and you can't mess with the Holy God. Yeah, I'm kind of jumping around, but it's also interesting to me that like with Ananias and Sapphira, uh, he could just drop them dead. Um, but with all of these nations of people, uh, it was necessary to have this mass slaughter where the people of Israel had to go in, fight. Many of them died in the process, and uh, and and it just was violent and, and horrific, uh, as any battle of that kind would have been. Because, um, because God, God's God's not not limited to me to me. I mean, He used the flood. In the time of Noah, he used brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, he uses his blessings come in different ways. He allows the sun to come off. He allows to, for you to eat apples, pears, oranges. He allows you to eat 
blessings come in different ways and judgments come in different ways. God, God's a creative God. He's not limited by one set means of dealing with a nation or an individual. How, we, how God will deal with you is not the same way that he'll deal with me. You might need more patience than, than me. Or he might, or God might need more patience with me than you. Uh, you might be far more intelligent than me, and I'm sure you are. And so you could grasp uh, biblical truth more quicker than me. And so you won't need, uh, you know, if you became a Christian, you wouldn't need you wouldn't need chastisement as much as me. It would be a slow learner. So, so God, God works in different ways, uh, and He's not limited. Yeah, I mean, but, but there are some ways that are just seem really, really bad. Like, just that no one, no one with uh, with any kind of sense would 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 do things that way. Um, well, the th the thing is, it's it's kind of like a, like a nail, you know. And you get a nail, and you get your hammer, and you bang that nail, bang that nail. And eventually, mm -hmm. the nail goes in, and well, that's what you're doing tonight. I, I don't mean this. In a disrespectful way, I believe that you're a very, very sincere person. But there's a nail that you keep banging and banging and banging, and basically what it is is, you know, I, I disagree, morally speaking, the way the Bible is morally. And you keep banging away at that. And I've, what, I've, what I've tried to do is to at least try to give you different perspectives on exegesis and theology and how you might come at these things. But I, I, would, I would ultimately... You know, come come down. If I was being, if I didn't think you were sincere, I would cut the ground off you straight away. But because I think you're sincere, yeah. I would cut your ground from under your feet. Is I would say to you, okay, morally speaking, you disagree with X, Y, Z in the Bible, and I would ask the question: Is morality objective or subjective? And if it's objective, could you tell me how it is objective? that you have an objective standard to be able to question the Bible and that is the way I would cut the ground from under you I've not done I've not done that I've let you keep hammering this one nail because I believe that you're not doing it facetiously you're doing it out of a genuine feeling that this is the way you are but that sure. those are the two questions that if we were in a proper debate that you would have to grapple with an answer and I don't think you find I find I think you would find it very hard to answer. Well, but I I mean, are, are you familiar with Sam Harris? Yeah. I find I find his his account of of morality very persuasive. Uh, that that essentially, you know, morality um, pivots on this idea of of human well-being, um, and that um, you know we. Uh, we can we can even begin to calculate um, the the benefits or harm to human well-being in much the same way we would uh, for human health. I mean, we can say that that human health is has an objective truth to it in some sense, um, but that that some things are are healthy and okay for some people and. And the same kinds of activities and things would be unhealthy for other people. Um, we can say the same for for morality, um, and then we can look at this from a broad lens and say, uh, you know, society as a whole, what kinds of things can we allow? What kinds of things should we not allow? And and begin to reason and and be be rational about it, and and take an approach of that's that. Looks at wellness as kind of the the determining factor, um, and say, uh, you know, make make value judgments based on that. Okay. Okay. Um, on this issue of human well-being, I would say that that is a subject. Even though you you, you would argue that we can substantiate that there are certain things that produce well-being, but There'll be m many th things that you might say is well-being. So, for example, for you, it might be well-being not to smoke. But for someone else, it might be well-being. So, 
what you say or what a group of people say is scientifically well-being doesn't necessarily mean to somebody else that it's well-being. So you still, I think, don't get out of the subjective issue. Well, it, it, just like health, right? I mean, we could say we can say that you know, for some people, um, eating peanut butter or nuts is is healthy, um, but there are people who will die if they eat peanut butter uh, because they have a severe allergy to it. Well, we can say that society can allow the people who can eat peanut butter to eat peanut butter or peanuts, and people who can't shouldn't be forced to, right? And we can allow for both to exist, and that produces a, a society that is um, well with respect to consumption of nuts as a, as a food. Okay, well, well, how does that work with, say, abortion? Uh, abortion is a difficult issue. So and, you have a fetus in the womb of a woman, and there's no particular reason why the fetus should be aborted, only the reason that the woman wants to exercise her right. Right, and, and I think... How does that work? How does your... How does we we get into the cash value of where the the where it, where this actually works or not? So sure, and and I'm I'm happy to to go here because I think it's I think it's a good exercise. Um, so there there are a couple of issues. One is the the ideal issue, and and ideally, yeah, I don't think that women should. Um, have abortions just for the sake of convenience, uh, for the sake of uh, they just don't like it. Um, and and in an ideal world where we could make those kinds of determinations and and sift out um, women who are are just doing it because they were negligent and you know when they were having intercourse, um, uh, maybe that would be maybe that would be good uh, to do that. Um, the reality is that, um, from a legal standpoint, and um, you know, a, a standpoint of, of our judicial systems and things like that, uh, it's very difficult to make those kinds of determinations. For one thing, um, and then there's an expediency factor because there are only nine months available um, in which those kinds of determinations can be made. And and our court systems don't have that kind of um, what's the word um, we, we we don't handle things quickly unfortunately um, and and just as a pragmatic matter because there are some circumstances where the vast majority of us would say okay this is a situation where maybe the mother's life is at stake um, and it's a it's a a very risky pregnancy. Maybe she's got children who are already, you know, living and depend upon her. Um, if if she and her husband feel that it's in the best interest of the family to abort, we wouldn't say no. You can't do that. Um, okay. You know, and and it's difficult for a court system to handle those things uh, in a way that is expedient and. Um, uh, and and fair. Okay. A um, couple of things there. Um, uh, my main question there was about. We're not on about the complications of family. You know, I, I you know the, it was clearly asked about just a woman who purely because she feels that she is going to have well-being and scientifically. She could provide data that women who have had abortions, from her perspective, have well-being. For according to your argument, that so long as it's well-being, then it would be okay to abort that, that, that fetus. Well, I mean, there, there are, again, there are. This is a multifaceted issue. Um, you have the well-being of a potential child. Uh, yeah. And and I don't discount that. Um, I think that, that that's a, a factor. And um, uh, as as so, the so here's, well, 
So all she's decided she's going to have an abortion, and that will make her well, and uh, and and give her well-being. And she's got scientific data to to prove it. Now there are tens of thousands of these people who feel the same, and they're able to get political influence, and they're able to get the law to to back them up. How did your philosophy of well-being accord with that? Well, I mean, if, first of all, we'd have to establish that that was the case, right? I mean, you could say, you could say, well, you know, people might develop science or something that uh, establish rape as as being contributive to well-being, um, and we could be very skeptical about that from the get-go, right? And and say, oh, well, that that doesn't seem to mesh with what we already know about uh, the effects of that. Um, so, um, but, but then too, as I said, um, there is, there's at least another potential life there. Um, and it's, uh, I, I think from a scientific and secular perspective, somewhat difficult to say where life begins exactly. Um, but we can say that it's, it's somewhere in there. Um, and and when you have uh, a, you know a, a, a fetus or uh, you know a baby that's that's you know developed to the stage of seven eight nine months uh, in the womb uh, that's you know and it's it's a viable fetus that can live uh, beyond the, the womb uh, you you've got a pretty strong case to be made that uh, this is a, a, a life um, but again, back to just you know pragmatic, uh, you know the, the the fact that we don't have good ways uh, right now of distinguishing between cases where there is a legitimate concern for the life of the mother or for her own rights. You know, maybe she's been violated in a rape or something like that. Um, our court cases are not nimble enough. To deal with those kinds of of distinctions in an expedient time frame that that doesn't push that time limit back and back and back, um, you know, if you have the beginning of a court case, to, you know, to determine whether or not a woman um, can have a legitimate abortion that uh, you know falls within the categories that we think might be permissible uh, versus those that we think are, are morally not permissible. Um, by the time a court's uh, sorted through all of that, weeks or months could have passed, and now we have uh, an abortion potentially that's more, more difficult and, uh, and maybe more morally um, reprehensible uh, than the initial. Mm. I mean, I don't. I don't like abortion. I don't. I don't. Nobody. Nobody that I've ever heard of says hooray for abortion. Um, but, but the fact of the matter is that there are cases where uh, it is certainly. Um, all, uh, all. You know, yeah. uh, Ron, I appreciate your very eloquent. I mean, you know, your eloquent uh, discussion there and sharing. Uh, the only thing I was trying to highlight there is. Is you were talk we were talking about objective morality of well-being, sure. uh, and all I was trying to show is when we talk about objective morality about well-being that it's you know the, there's going to be competing views of what well-being is and right. how and how it is applied. That's all I'm saying. And like this, you know, and and, and um, I'm not saying that you you, you it's not possible. To get some kind of objective understanding, but I'm just saying it seems to me highly improbable, uh, and I'm just trying to show that there are, that there are there will be these competing views about what is well-being and how it's applied. Sure, absolutely, but we can have intelligent conversations about it, and then, and there are going to be definitely some areas that are maybe a little fuzzy because it's difficult. I mean, end of life is another. Uh, another area that becomes a bit fuzzy and, and it's maybe hard to say definitively this is what happens and this is when life ends and this is uh, you know X Y and Z uh, but 
but we can we can look at the facts and we can try and and reason through them and we can make the best determination that we can with the information that we have at hand. I I would say that the you know I'm not saying that scientific knowledge um, uh, is not helpful in helping us to understand what decisions to make, but I would say that uh, you know there are deep philosophical issues about about value, what is value, why is something value, valuable and how does um, a naturalistic perspective uh, explain value um, and why we value some things and some why we value human beings and why we don't value other things and you know so what I'm saying is that um, you know if we went into those things and that you know, it would put a strain um, on your on your position. So, for example, um, you know, if we've evolved, uh, if that's if that's your position that we've evolved, uh, and morality is part of the evolutionary process, at what point in that process can there be? an absolute moral standard because if you're in a historical flow and a process there's never going to be a, a point at which you've arrived or at which you will ever say is that objective standard. Well, I don't think it has to be absolute I think it has to be objective in some sense and I, I would I would point to the development of, of Western medicine and, and uh, medical science as a comparative thing. I mean, we would say that there's an objective truth about whether or not someone is healthy, um, and they can have a medical exam and say, well, by our, our best understanding, this is a healthy person. Um, we can say ob objectively that there are, there are situations where human well-being is increased or decreased um, on a you know, maybe difficult, a more difficult scale to put it on, yeah. um, but we can say that it. You know, uh, Sam Harris says, well, uh, you know, we can say medically, health um, does not involve vomiting all the time, and we can say that objectively. Um, you know, we can say that that well-being does not include um, being oppressed or having uh, restricted human rights and things. I mean, that's part of, of well-being. Mm. I think, uh, you know, culturally, I mean, you know, what... In terms of the history of culture and variety of cultures, cultures have different understandings of what well-being is. If you do, if you do uh, sociological research in Japanese and... If you do sociological scientific research on the issue of happiness for example and you look at what makes a culture happy what makes Jap the Japanese happy what makes them feel that they have well-being is not say for example the same as Western culture right so, so when you say that you think there is this kind of general standard if you actually compare uh, different cultures, so I, I'd encourage you to go and look at the, whatever the recent research is on scientific research on on happiness and what makes Japanese culture uh, people in Japanese culture feel happy, and and then compare it to say what it means to Western completely different picture of of what how they see. Um, I know that I'm changing terms. But they do dovetail into each other about well-being. Sure, but I don't. I don't think that it's fair to say it's completely different. I mean, there are certain differences that are, are clear um, between cultures. And here's a question, though, Ron. Yeah. Have you ever studied the scientific research on happiness in Japanese culture? I haven't. No. Well, I did a few years ago. I listened to a lecture on it. So um, it, when, when I'm t when I'm saying this, I. I I have some I have some kind of understanding there that if you actually look at it, there the, there are there might be some similarities in in certain areas, but then there are big variables on certain things that we think are important. But I mean, it was a couple of years ago since I looked at it. But if you look at it, 
you, it's quite shocking what actually uh, makes Japanese culture uh, tick. Uh, I enjoy I enjoy I enjoy cultural studies. I can't talk, um, but uh, I, I work for uh, an international uh, development uh, organization that that works with families and communities uh, all around the world uh, to help them, you know, uh, escape poverty and hunger and things. Um, but uh, part of the job that that I really enjoy is just interacting with with people from all around the world and things and and uh, I know there and recognize that there are stark differences um, between cultures I I uh, Good for you, mate. I'm, I'm impressed Ron I'm, I'm, I'm impressed well thank you <laughs> I'm impressed. Listen. I am I enjoy it. I very much enjoy it. I love going into work every day and, and you know being a part of, of what we do. Um, but um, it, it, it's nearly quarter past one. Oh yeah. So I'm gonna give you the final say. You can have the final say, and I just want to say before you finish that it was an absolute delight to talk to you, sir. You you're a wonderful man, and I've really enjoyed chatting to you, bro. Well, thank you. I've, I've enjoyed our, our conversation, too. I, I wish more people could have uh, just uh, respectful conversations like this. Uh, it's, it's excellent. I'll let um, you, you, you say your final bit, and then we'll, we'll call it a day. And if you want to say goodbye to the viewers, and if you want to uh, point them to your um, blog, and I'm going to read up on your blog. Sure. Yeah, uh, my blog is run, Gavagai run at blogspot.com, and it's R-U-N-G-A-V-A-G-A-I-R-U-N, run, Gavagai run. Gavagai is from a thought experiment, a thought experiment by Quine, but if you go to my Google Plus page, um, you, you'll find a link to the, to the blog there. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't. I mean, I, I think that just to, to wrap up here, um, I, I don't think either of us was was persuaded by by the other one tonight. But I, I've I've enjoyed the conversation, and and uh, you've given me some things that I want to look into further. And um, I, I hope that you know I've maybe at least given you some food for thought too. So you have you have run. Uh, thank you, mate, for sharing what you shared, and. Um, yeah, I'll be chewing on some of the things that you've said, mate. So thanks a lot, bro, and thank you for your time. All right. Um, Have a good night, Jason. You too, mate. I uh, hope I see you again, bro. Take care. Take care, mate.